an abandonment. But this movie was, it was very important for me. Thematically, we can talk about it for a long, long time. The movie is incredibly carefully planned. Those, the screenplay is laid out really carefully to, to talk about uh, disobedience, number one, mm -hmm. as a virtue. Mm -hmm. It's the opposite of all the Pinocchios. This is, if you're disobedient, is a virtue, which is more urgent today than ever, you know? To be able to say no to what feels wrong and you have to fight against. And um, the other one was paternity. Mm. We have several father and son stories. And they were, um, I love my dad uh, after Shape of Water. And all of my movies, most of my movies deal with father figures. And then I lost my mom the day before we opened Pinocchio. And I realized the real shadow in my life had been my mother. Mm. And when I, I was trying to figure out my dad, but really, my mom was the question mark, wow. you know, and, and it hit me very deeply. But but I, I I wanted to decipher my father, and what it what I became when I became a father is the hardest profession in the world, and the one where I've gotten the worst reviews. <laughs> <laughs> Guess what? Guess what? You're about to get your best. Oh, thank you, thank for you. Sure. But but it is uh, is Pinocchio and Geppetto, is Spazzatura and Volpe. Uh, Podesta and Candlewick, and even Jesus and his father. Yeah. And you talk about a father that demanded too much of his son. <laughs> and, and, and fascism is a paternalistic concern. It's a father figure thing. Uh, I want to ask you about, about the setting, about the tone. Uh, this was not what I expected from a Pinocchio movie at all, and I mean that in, in all the right ways. So, so when did it hit you that, and you, you said that you kind of jumped into this after Pan's Labyrinth. To Earlier. Much earlier, no, I started. To, I decided to do animation after Pants. So, but the 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 tone of it, the setting it in fascist Italy. Well, he, here's the deal. I mean, I'm, I'm a student and a collector of fairy tales and fairy tale lore, mm. and uh, uh, there are three ways you can adapt uh, fairy tale lore, and one of them is a straight, uh, the way you know it is done normally. The second one is to do it in an adult way, like. Uh, Company of Wolves, the, uh, the Neil Jordan movie, mm -hmm. which is a, a, a very adult tone, and I find it a little jarring, but highly interesting. And the third one is what I tried to do, which they should still function as fairy tales, but the depth is almost like putting a pedal on a note in a piano. It's a deeper note, but you can go to the high notes. You can go to the magic or the fantasy or the humor or the, you know, and, and come back. And, and that's really, really hard, but that's, that's a tone that is very hard to balance. For some people, it will work. For others, it won't. But that's what I've been doing all of my life. The Shape of Water was a Douglas Sirk love story between an amphibian man and a woman with musical numbers. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 those are very hard things to balance. And, but, but I've been doing that. Kronos was a middle-class vampire <laughs> in a household in Mexico City post-NAFTA. So, you know, these are very crazy combinations. When I pitched Pedro Almodovar, The Devil's Backbone, Pedro said, it's three movies. I said, no, 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 it's one movie. <laughs> and, and, and that, uh, but to me, there is a particular flavor. Look, if you don't like sushi, don't come to my restaurant, right? I prepare <laughs> a certain type of dish. But uh, for me, there is a value in having uh, Mussolini arrive in a Tex Avery limousine from a Warner Brothers cartoon, and then a few minutes later, have a really heartfelt talk about death or about two kids that are alone in a, in a bedroom whispering to each other. It's very nice to go from one to the other. Yeah. And, and it is uh, something that I, I seek and that makes it mine in a sense, you know? Well, I, I, when it comes to you, we love sushi. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Thank you. Well, it's a strange dish. I like it. Uh, I, I want to ask about the design. Uh, when it came to the design, I mean, you're working with the Jim Henson Company here. Like, when it came to the design of particularly Pinocchio, and of course, Geppetto, since he's here. The best actor. Yeah. <laughs> what we did is, I don't know how familiar you guys are with the stop motion. We can talk a long time about it. But, uh, stop motion was technically pushed about 10, 15 years into the future by Leica. But one of the things that also came to the forefront was printed faces. And that 
in, uh, is almost trying to make it CG, and that's not what we were looking for. We were looking for mechanical puppets to return the animation to the animators, give them complete control, because if you print a thousand faces, even if you print a thousand faces, what if the animators need a thousand and five? You're still giving them a catalog, and so we went to McKinnon and Saunders in, uh, in uh, England, which is the best company for mechanical puppets, and they made this mechanical puppet, uh, or all of them. These are all mechanized, uh, and you move them frame by frame, and for example, if you wanna lower the eyebrows, you lower the eyebrows, you know? If you want him to do a, an O sound, the mouth is mechanized to do an O, or a U, or an A. And you move them, if you want his hair to move with the wind, you move the hair <laughs> with the wind. You know? So he's rigged, and if you hold this for me, and uh, we, we did even a thing called a shoulder roll, which Harry Housen used beautifully, look at this. He can do that, or he can be arrogant. <laughs> and defeating, and even, even if you look at it, if we can take him out of his base, it would look that we even hinge his heel, so when he walks with the wooden shoe, the heel would come out. It would flip flop on his, oh. on his foot. And planning those puppets takes a while, designing them also. If you see the movie, or when you see the movie again, pay attention to one thing, our acting is unlike any stop motion movie ever made. Why, because uh, unfortunately, in North America, it is believed that uh, animation is a genre for kids. It isn't, it's a medium. Animation is film, animation is art. And we should be able to tell stories that are complex, great action, great drama, great comedy, and explore themes that are not pandering to kids. That, and on top of that, I don't believe they make movies for kids. They make them for fucking helicopter parents. <laughs> and I, they, if they were making movies really for kids, kids process an enormous amount of horrible information every day. Horrible, mostly from their parents. <laughs> or, or, you know, it is, and, and it's to me, it is very simple. If you, even if you make them for kids, give them something complex enough that they can use it to understand the world. Not give them a world that is not true. The world is a paradoxical world made of horrible and beautiful things. Anyway, full circle to what I was gonna say. <laughs> the acting has been dictated by a pantomime style that has been handed over and over through the decades and is this super hip, super cute, suburban style, you know, that of, of, of this super cool kids from the valley that are sassy and skateboard and have one-liners. Who the fuck is that? <laughs> number one. And, and, and number two, uh, that has been codified almost to an emoji. You see the same faces and the same poses in all the goddamn animated movies. Not a single character in this movie is cool, hip, or sassy. <laughs> we went for real acting. One, we, we gave the animators eight rules of animation. We said, animate silence. Animate characters listening, feeling, and inputting the information that they're being given by the, uh, by the character talking. Meaning, we're gonna do micro gestures. Uh, I said, never look, in animation you always have the guy talking, and then the guy answering, or the character answering. Here, we got to the character listening, and they nod, they look away, they think about it, they look up, etc. Now, we, we launched every single shot of this movie, was launched with the animators, and we said, I don't want you to move the goddamn puppet, I want you to make it be alive. Mm -hmm. Animate means to give an anima, a soul, to give soul to an inanimate object. So, what is a character thinking? What is a character feeling? Animation has the tendency to be too goddamn animated. Mm -hmm. Everyone moves, and the camera moves, and zip zaps, and they come, and they are, oh, and it's like a sitcom. And we said, let's animate really quiet moments. Father and son sitting on a bench, having a really quiet talk, and let's animate 
every unnecessary gesture. Hayao Miyazaki says something that we used as a, two things he says that are magical for me. One, Miyazaki says, if you animate the ordinary, it will be extraordinary. And then he says, Western animation is interested in animating hands clapping. I'm interested in the space between the two claps. You know, and what we did is this. How many movements does it take in real life for you to sit? Six, seven. In animation, it's all super efficient. They just sit. You know, if you have a cup, it's always orientated for the character to grab it. No, no, no. Point the cup the wrong way. Have the character turn the cup. Finally grab it. It's too hot. Give me all the unnecessary gestures. If you watch the movie again, it's, there are failed acts. My favorite, and you will remember this. Uh, when Geppetto enters the abandoned uh, arena and the carnival has gone, he gets tangled with a balloon and fights it. Now, of course, it looks like an improv from an actor. But this actor is moved 24 frames a second. <laughs> and the balloon is rigged with a little crane to be able to interact with him. So next time you see the movie, look for all the failed acts. How many, how many movements, how many times they fail to lock a door? Uh, when Geppetto in the church, when you watch it, you saw it already, it's not a spoiler. <laughs> he sits down, and he sits down a little far from the box. He scooches. He goes for the box and he notices a jar that is loose. He moves the jar and then he closes it. Those are the things that tell you these, are, these guys are alive. So that, and we did, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I, I could talk to you. I mean, we've been making this goddamn movie for so many years. Five years of production, 16 years trying to make it more. Uh, and every day, talk, all the animators are credited along with the cast. Because we said to them, you are actors. You're not technicians. I, I, I want to ask you a big, you know, a quick, one last question, but the casting. One last question. The, yeah, yeah. Time flies. Uh, the casting of, of Pinocchio. Who, who was the perfect Pinocchio? How did you find them? The ratio is always the same. A hundred horrible kids for one good one, for the perfect one. And whether it's Pan's Labyrinth, Devil's Wagon, you have entire armies of kids that have been doing yogurt commercials <laughs> or sitcoms and they come with their father and mother that have been reading the lines oh how are you oh how are you and, and it's horrible and more horrible and when we get to 90 i go here it comes and about kid number 109 or 108 or 102 they come in and they're perfect and when you look as you do with any actor it's for somebody that is Pinocchio. Uh, so uh, Gregory came in and read, and there was a purity to him being there. He was a kid. And, and then directing it, you had to sort of create the environment for him to engage. And uh, if I needed him to be irreverent, for example, I would say, push my belly and call me dummy. So I was like, shut up, dummy. And I said, now let's do the tape. I, can I have some chocolate? Please, 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 please. You know, so you provoke the emotion before doing it, but he was a really good actor. He was fantastic. So, so just a couple of announcements. So, so first of all, please stay seated while we exit. That's for a second. Make are we, sure that- Are we done? What, we're done. Let's do another one. Okay, okay, another one. Another question. Yes. All right, one more question. Let's do another question. Let's do another question. Uh, I, a good one. A good one. This is a good one. This is a, one I couldn't wait to ask you. So, so you're making this film while you are making The Shape of Water, while you are making Nightmare uh, Alley. Alley. And, and, and Cabinet then, of Curiosity. And then in the middle, like a like few, few weeks into Nightmare Alley, you have to stop because of the freaking pandemic. Same with, same with here. So, so how did you do this? <laughs> well, everybody that worked in the movie, I'm co-directing with one of the great uh, guys in animation, Mark Gustafsson. He started with Will Binton on doing the clay animation days. He really is a creative partner that I adore and trust and love. The producers are Shadow Machine, who have done everything from Robot Chicken to features, yeah. you know, and, and they are in, incredibly experienced. So what you need to do is uh, you need to make it safe. That's the first thing. You don't want, uh, you know, uh, no movie is worth dying for. Yeah. No movie. I don't care what it is. 
life is more important than the movie. So we make it safe for the crew, and then we start. You know, we shot, just so you get an idea, how many Geppettos do you think we have? We have around 18 Geppettos, 22 Pinocchios, uh, seven or eight Volpes, blah, blah, blah. Why? Because we shoot at the same time in miniature sets. At the end of the movie, we were shooting with 65 sets. Wow. At the same time, 60, 65 light packages, 65 cameras, all running at the same time. We needed to launch 10, 12 shots, approve 20 shots at night, blah, blah. But on the beginning, we started with one set. And the COVID landed when we were working in the double digits. Wow. So what we have is a huge warehouse, and somebody's animating in that corner, and someone is animating in that corner, yeah. someone, et cetera, et cetera. And we shot for a thousand days almost, 900 and... 70, whatever, I mean, and we were pegging the 1,000. And we always did this with the crew, uh, staying safe. We did, we had to mount an operation of testing that was basically, we created a miniature hospital lab yeah. to test all the hundreds of people that came every day. And uh, that's about it. Thank you for coming. Did you get your poster? Well, okay, okay. So that's the other thing. Oh, on your way it. out, <laughs> on your way out, one, you, know, you get make sure you get a signed poster, one per person. And I here's signed the, it. I, wait, wait. Oh, oh, oh. I signed it. <laughs> it's a smiling sun. <laughs> and one more, one more announcement. Now that you have seen this film, make sure you spread the word. Yes, please. And how do you spread the word? How do you spend tell, tell every fucking money. <laughs> go on social media, go on Facebook. Instagram. Go on, go on Instagram. Go to the churros next door. <laughs> but, but I'll tell you this, there are three posters. It's a horrible tactic, but if you want all three, they form an image. And it's one on each theater this week. So you're screwed. <laughs> I hope you see it. I hope you see it again in the big theater, and I hope you see it with somebody you love and want to have a chat with. Because this movie, to me, made me want to call my dad and my mom if I had them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.